think we'll get started now. I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. Um, we're really fortunate today to have uh, Sergio Fazio visiting us. Uh, Sergio got his MD at the University of Rome and, and grew up, as I learned last night, speaking Roman, which is uh, a, a dialect, as is uh, apparently... A little bit better than Italian. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the pattern in, in Italy where regional dialects uh, trump um, uh, the, the national language. Um, he got his uh, uh, MD at, at the University of Rome and his PhD at the University of Siena and uh, completed that training at, at UCSF and then did a postdoctoral fellowship and was a staff investigator at Gladstone Institute of Cardiovascular Disease where we barely missed uh, overlapping. And uh, <coughs> he then uh, joined Vanderbilt, uh, and where he was on the faculty for 20 years. Uh, he was a co-founder of the Lipid Clinic, co-director of the Atherosclerosis Research Unit, and uh, chief of the section on cardiovascular disease uh, prevention. In uh, 2014, he came back out west and uh, has been at OHSU since, since then uh, as the William and Sonia Con Connor Chair of Preventive Cardiology and the Director of Preventive Cardiology. So although Sergio uh, trained as an endocrinologist, he's uh, been in a division of cardiology for many years. He's widely recognized as, a, as an expert, uh, both clinically and, uh, and in terms of his scientific work, has been elected to the ASCI and AAP, uh, has extensive study section service. I had the pleasure of serving with Sergio just last week on, on the study section. Uh, also a member of several editorial boards, uh, in including um, circulation research. His research has been focused on experimental atherosclerosis, and uh, Sergio and his uh, scientific partner, uh, Mac Linton, were really responsible for the technique of using, applying bone marrow transplantation to investigation of, uh, of atherogenesis, uh, using that to define the contributions of hematopoietic cells to atherosclerosis really a, uh, a game-changing uh, technique that uh, Sergio developed a number of years ago. He's an expert in lipoprotein metabolism, um, the genetic basis of hyperlipidemias, as well as uh, treatment of dyslipidemias. And he's even done a little bit of work on um, gene therapy for atherosclerosis, which is another interest we share. His papers have uh, been published in, in outstanding journals, ranging from New England Journal and Annals of Internal Medicine, JCI, Nature, and, and Science. Uh, so we're really, oh, and the Bangkok Medical Journal, at least two publications. Two, <laughs> uh, but I'm the editor, so I can place any, any article. I may tell you something about the Bangkok Connection if you're curious, but. So today, Sergio's gonna talk to us about managing lipids to control cardiovascular disease, boundaries and limits. Sergio. All right, well, thank you so very much. That was such a beautiful introduction. I feel like I don't need to add anything. Uh, and thank you also for respecting my request to not have anyone in the front row. Um, thank you. So I, I, I was at dinner with uh, David and the good group of UW faculty last night. And uh, I got concerned. I said, look, it's a tough crowd. Cardiology grant rounds. You, uh, You'll need to really work hard to keep everyone awake. And uh, if when you start with uh, something that says lipids, you are at such a disadvantage, right? Because some of you are already tuning out, right? So I will, I will look at you. I see everything, right? So you need to be really good at, uh, at falling asleep with your eyes open. All right, so I have a disclosure. The uh, OHSO uh, system allows for us to be consultants for company, not to, not to give lectures, of course, but uh, to consult and give our opinion to some companies. So it is all uh, through um, the approval process at OHSO. Now, um, you, you have, any of you have watched Portlandia? Right. Remember, remember that it was a season three where the mayor of Portland complained because the Mo Portland magazine had Seattle as the, as the space needle in the cover saying, come on, man, we need to have something about Portland in Portland magazine. So the way when I moved from Vanderbilt to OHSU, right away I felt like, all right, 
I joined the congregation of smaller cousins of, of UW who are looking up to the big boys and eventually they want to grow up to be like them. But, uh, um, but we are such beauty down there, right? So I want to start with things that we don't, that you don't need to come up here to find this kind of beauty. One hour and 15 minutes from OHSU. This one, do you, have you ever done this one? Beautiful place for hiking. This is just 25 minutes, and actually you park in the middle of the freeway and you walk under the freeway to get on this one. This, this has been closed for almost a year after the fire of, of two summers ago, but now it's open again, you can go all the way up. And um, you think only in Washington you can ski? No, it's one hour. We have three resorts. Um, on uh, Mount Hood, and uh, the first one is exactly one hour from OHSU, and it's open on many days until 11 p.m. And remember that Timberline has the longest ski season in the U.S. And if you want to just have the satisfaction of skiing in July, it's open. There is one, one run open through the summer. All right, so with that, I start. I start with, uh, with the, uh, a kind of a patient request that, is, that, that comes very often. A patient who has had um, an acute event, an intervention, and comes to me saying, the doctor, the cardiologist says, you take care of the rest, right? So the questions range from, I have also, like in this case, you can see the conclusions that there was uh, a single vessel uh, disease, but, but then if you look at the full report, you see that actually it's diffuse atherosclerosis. Of course, the stent goes in one place, but the patient registered the idea of, um, of smaller plaques, and uh, for some reason they come to our clinic saying, and the cardiologist says you're going to clean up our plaques, right? So the general point of my conversation, where I will go into later, is how good are we at cleaning up plaques? How much can we promise to a patient that we can do something for um, a 25% occluding lesion and uh, make it smaller? I don't know what you guys say, uh, how good you are at lying, but we, we just can't promise that much to our patients. So a plaque that grows versus a plaque that shrinks or that doesn't grow, there are, of course, some obvious things. You don't even need to know biology or, a, or pathologic anatomy to come up with reasons why a plaque gets bigger or, or might get smaller. To get bigger, you need material in it. And what is the material? Of course, the lipids and lipoproteins, but that it doesn't occupy much volume. Mo most of the volume is uh, cellular um, arrival. And what are the cells of the plaque? You have two types of cells, right? You have blood-derived monocytes that will turn into macrophages, and then eventually you have a de-differentiation, this magical thing, <coughs> de-differentiation of smooth muscle cells that uh, instead of being elongated and, and minding a business of tensile strength and, uh, and elastic recoil, they start moving, they act like they're macrophages, they join the force with, uh, with monocyte-derived macrophages and they start gobbling up things in, um, in the subendothelial space. Plus, and then you have things like collagen deposition, right? You have cell death, you have um, uh, calcification. There are lots of things that happen and increase the uh, the, uh, the structure, the complexity of the plaque, and uh, the, 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 the volume of the plaque. Now, when plaques want to shrink, what do you envision? Something must get out, right? First of all, you need to stop the growth, and then material need to exit. What can exit from a plaque? Lipids can exit. You know, if you remember the HDL system, the HDL system is supposed to be there to allow for excess tissue cholesterol to be picked up and brought uh, into a central location, the liver. Um, of course, the HDL system is not created to go after the atheroma. It's created to go after our natural tissues. The atheroma is nothing like a natural tissue. But there are also cells that can exit the atheroma. So macrophages, 
are migratory cells, and uh, if they are alive and well, they could move out of a plaque. So there, there is potential for <coughs> exit, and um, it's just strange that we don't know how to exploit it. So I, um, um, if you don't mind, I, I do it for my own sake to not look at the slides. Because if I look at the slides, then I have the temp. Remember that even though I look like a cardiologist, I'm an endocrinologist. And so we, uh, we followed all the, the arrows and things until everybody is done. So I will not look at, um, at the slides. I will just tell you what the main gist of a, of a, of a projected image is. And so the uh, progression, of course, needs all the forces that are not good for you. And I don't need to name them for you as good doctors that you guys are. But let's just uh, stick with one thing, like a, a cholesterol environment in the blood that it's, uh, that it's inducive to plaque growth, like bringing cholesterol inside the uh, arterial wall in the subendothelial space. That produces a lot of, of, of problems, ranging from the accumulation of cholesterol, uh, the uh, engorgement uh, of cells uh, with cholesterol, both in, uh, in the cytoplasm and in the membrane, which messes up production of, uh, and, and um, distribution of receptors. But also, there are many indirect mechanisms that, that maintain the uh, problem with uh, the plaque, con in including the fact that, as you know, a plaque is a tissue that grows below the endothelium of a medium caliber artery, and uh, a, 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 an artery is fed by the vasovasorum of the adventitia, and the, that concept means that, that um, the vasovasorum feed the, uh, the media because the, the subendothelial space is normally virtual. When you grow a plaque, it basically you dissect a virtual space and create a physical space and nutrition is always an issue. So as the plaque grows, the more a plaque grows, the more hypoxia is an issue with the plaque because the vasovasorum are not reaching into that and the diffusion from the lumen is not enough for, for nutrition. What is a regressive environment? A regressive environment is when you don't have a progressing environment anymore, right? So very, very easily, if you translate it into clinical practice, you, you think of a patient whose cholesterol now is way down, whose blood pressure is well controlled, who not smoking, following great diet, exercising, having, uh, applying all the meditation techniques, having lost a few pounds. And so you say, okay, we end with the right medication. Now the environment should be conducive to you, if you have a plaque that was ejected into the lumen by 25%, maybe you shrink that a little bit. We always, even if the HDL concept has completely failed us, many of us are still uh, having some hopes that it's simply that we're not smart enough to figure out how the HDL works. We're not definitely saying that the HDL was a hoax, okay? But, but we stand at the point where we don't know what to do with HDL and how to use the HDL concept with our patients. But the idea is extraction of lipids, reduction of inflammation, and, uh, and the macrophages that are there, the ones that are alive, um, they might start rolling out again if we improve the circumstances. I'll get back to that. Now I, I take a little divergent to keep you um, interested with um, data from, um, from the uh, PCSK9 inhibitor studies. First of all, I like a little show of sincerity. I say, PCSK9, raise your hand if you go like, what? Sincerity? All right. <laughs> All right. OK, good. No hands go up, so I don't describe to you what they do. But they are strong. So for example, in, in one of the two uh, cardiovascular outcome trials, the, um, the, the LDL level uh, that you achieve by adding the uh, PCSK9 inhibitor every two, actually in this case, every four weeks, um, to statin is, is in the 30s with so many people in the less than 20, with a bunch of people with less than 10 LDL, okay? So we are now finally at the end of the exploration of, it, of the LDL hypothesis. Right? Because it's not like w next we're going to wonder what happens at minus five. We're done. Okay, so we are now fully aware of what you do when you take someone with atherosclerosis and with risk of clinical events, um, subsequent events, and, um, 
and you try to smash LDL to nothing. And what happens is something good, but not something great. Okay? So I'm a lipid guy. I would have loved to say, and voila, ladies and gentlemen, the cure. Okay, so this one is not the cure. This is a slice of risk reduction. It's good, but it's not great. Why? Why does removal of cholesterol, almost complete removal of cholesterol, doesn't allow for much better outcomes? And uh, the same happened with the um, uh, other trial, the, um, the trial with the other medication. There are two medications in the, in the market, as you know, and they're pretty much the same, uh, although the study designs and the patient enrollments were different, so, but I, I'm not here to m make um, distinctions about clinical trials. The point is that it shows pretty much the same thing. A statin with an LDL around 80 or 90 versus a statin plus the injection with an LDL around 30 or 35, and that's what you get. Okay? You get risk reduction, 15%. Why, why, why can't you protect 85% of the expected events? by driving cholesterol to near zero. I mean, this is just, it's a sobering piece of information. And I am one of the people that were really praying at night for a much larger effect. And um, as you know, we have gotten in the last three or four years, larger effects with unexpected interventions like in diabetes or with uh, factor 10 antagonism or more recently with, uh, with, with uh, one prescription formulation of fish oil. But this is just for you if you have questions for me. I want to just take you to my laboratory for a while. Now, hopefully I have engaged you enough so that you will allow for me to give you a couple of things that you might not even care about, but at least take them as an example of what can be done. To me, the, the biggest um, uh, message I want to convey to you is what I have been doing at OHSU in the last five years, which is the theme is let's do discovery as we do standard of care or excellence of care. So that is my dream of the, uh, this last part of my career, which is um, having a group of very good doctors that manage to do science while doing clinical medicine without a design of a clinical trial, and uh, I will show you. So first of all, I want to tell you a little story that, ca that is developing in our laboratory on um, the connection between PCSK9 and lipoprotein A. Now, you're a sincere group. Let me ask you a different question. How many of you test for, test for LPA? Okay. How many of you do not know what is LPA? Okay. So, there is a good distribution. And just for you to know, lipoprotein A should be, could be simplified. In your mind, if you never have dealt with this concept, lipoprotein A is an LDL. Okay? It's an LDL that on the average patient you see is less than 10% of LDL, except that you don't have very good tests to discriminate how much LDL in, in your blood is actually l -pridol A because the methodology is intrinsically very complex. And here at UW, you have the world expert on the methodology and structure of lipoprotein A with Santissa Markovina. She's exceptional, but this is an exceptional challenge to, um, to, to the study of biology because your LDL and mine, very similar. If you extract my LDL and you mix it with yours, you cannot take them apart anymore. There is a little bit of size distribution, but the composition is the same. My l A and yours, David, uh, not likely to be the same. And actually, David has two forms from mother and father, just like every one of you. And the, the issue with l -A is that the polymorphism is due to length. It's not an amino acid change. It's actually length. So just bottom line of l -A, LDL with a mutant protein attached. What is this mutant protein? It's a modification of plasminogen. It's just one kringle of plasminogen repeated over and over. How many times? Up to 40 plus times. So you can have uh, an epilidol A that is this, like this, an epilidol A that is like that, and every one of us is likely heterozygote for very different alleles. And of course, when you weigh lipoprotein A, the 
presence of this protein changes the weight and so the methodological issues are enormous here but for the sake of the study I, I see that I'm already boring some of you <laughs> for the sake of the study it is an LDL right so what does LDL do exits the bloodstream through LDL receptor right what do PCSK9 inhibitors do upregulate LDL receptors Statins, so that you know, just to give it to you as a background, statins don't do anything on lipoprotein A, and they reduce LDL by 35, 40%. So before the PCSK9 inhibitors, the idea was lipoprotein A is not behaving like LDL, cannot clear through the LDL receptor, probably because the attached apolidol A, that mutant additional protein, is probably covering the ability of apol B to um, um, at attach to or bind to the LDL receptor. Okay? Now, with the PCSK9 inhibitors, that's what you have. You have, what I showed you before, that um, kind of 60% reduction in LDL, but you also have a consistent uh, 27 to 30 percent reduction in l -pridol A. So that people have started to change their minds saying, you know what, I think maybe the statins don't upregulate the LDL receptor enough. Mm -hmm. When you really upregulate the LDL receptor, you have, uh, you have exit of um, lipoprotein A through that clearance mechanism, maybe not as efficient. This is data from 27,000 people, so it's as good as physics and mathematics. I think the ratio of 2 to 1 is there. For some reason, if you look at a population and you upregulate maximally LDL receptor, you have twice more removal of LDL than you have l -A. Okay? And recently, I was part with, uh, with Michelle O'Donoghue and Mark Sabatin at Harvard. We, we just published this the, a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it's not even published. I, I saw the, the proofs the other day. But, um, but this is a, a, an attempt at using the Fourier to look at how reductions in L A predict cardiovascular events. And, uh, and we were allowed by, um, by the reviewers to make a claim that uh, that not, not just LDL reduction, but also l A reduction is linked to benefits in the Fourier trial. Now, as you might imagine, LDL and l A are similar. If they use the same <coughs> pathway, because PCSK9 inhibitors activate the LDL receptor, so there is a correlation between a drop in one and a drop in the other, right? And that's completely expected. There is a degree of correlation in in individual patients uh, between the amount of LDL lowering and the amount of L-pridole lowering. And here enters the value of um, a registry created without uh, a clinical design. So we have an IRB that allows for us in the course of doing clinic uh, to, uh, to have just in less than three minutes, we, um, we can organize for the donation of blood and the entry into the red cap registry of our patients and uh, including the Buffy coat if they put uh, their initials on, uh, on the genetic side of the analysis. But uh, we started it without ideas. We wanted unique phenotypes. We wanted uh, strange presentation, uh, uh, family clustering. And, um, and then we ended up also putting all our PCSK9 treated patients on, uh, on this cohort. We have an approval for four blood draws, and so for the PCSK9 cohort, it works very well. Baseline, we do five days within third injection, five days within the injection at six months, and five days within the, uh, from the injection at 12 months. So it's basically a, a coordinated clinical trial-like structure for a standard of care management of things. So we use that one, and now we have uh, 300. This is when I when we were at 270, and what we just published in circulation research that we, uh, with this uh, real-life cohort, we repeat exactly what clinical trials are showing, a 60% reduction in LDL and a 28% reduction in l -pridole. So nothing, again, no ideas, just mind your business, put material into the registry, and do good work as a doctor. And then I see this patient, the patient um, who, um, Manage, you know, qualified for PCSK9 inhibitor after being on, uh, 
on, um, on statin therapy, and uh, she had a very high calcium score. And because she had familial hypercholesterolemia, we were able to make her approved for the um, monoclonal antibody. Look at what happens to LDL with atorvastatin versus atorvastatin plus antibody. It's a 100-point drop. Can you visualize this drop as like an incredible opening of the LDL receptor clearance pathway? Can you look at that? Just look at that. Look at the LDL from the plasma being sucked in the liver by the upregulation of the LDL receptor. Look at the LPLA, 80 and 89. So all that opening didn't attract LPLA in this patient. And I presented this case to my group and I said, why don't we write a case report on uh, discordance between LDL and LPLA response in one patient? Message number one, always choose your your colleagues smarter than you because the uh, the group looked at me and says uh, if it happens to one it happens to two and if it happens to two it happens to ten and we just need to look at all our cohort and see how often this happens and uh, we um, went back into our cohort and we had to use some meaningful criteria and so we ended up having very few cases but we published a, a paper two years ago claiming up to 40 percent discordance between LDL drop and l delay drop which means that in human biology it's very common to have a case where with the upregulation of the LDL receptor the LDL drops but the l delay doesn't and I am talking only clinically relevant cases of l delay this is above 30 or above 50. Okay? So then we were not happy with our cohort and we went to um, um, let's see we went to bag with um, um, people that have larger data sets and um, we just uh, published this in Jaha, I think it's just out, Jaha um, and Never mind the title, actually. I think this is part of a third study that we're having with, um, with the Sanofi people. This one is actually with the Evolocumab. So it's, um, it's the Proficio data set. It's not the Odyssey data set. But we show, and we just published it now, that up to 30% of people in an organized uh, grouping of clinical trials shows appropriate reductions in LDL and no changes, no significant changes in LPLA. Now this, of course, means nothing to those of you who are not into metabolism, but it's, it's a big deal to understand how PCSK9 inhibitors deal, um, affect uh, lipoprotein A, particularly because it's possible that the indication eventually may, may be to uh, improve cardiovascular risk for l late reductions when, when that data is more clear. Just an example. And it didn't work. I don't see uh, you excited. So I'm, I'm going to try with a second example. Yeah. So, quick question. But is there a relationship between the size of the population? So that, uh, did you hear that? And uh, that's why I come here to get good questions. <laughs> I come here to get intelligent questions that go to the heart of things. So we have been. We have been, uh, one of the things I will discuss with Santissa today is if she can help with uh, discriminating isoforms and see if there is an isoform dependent um, pathway to respond. So of course it would be lovely to say, you know, up to 33 repeats, um, you don't block the um, uh, pathway and that you clear. And uh, when, when the epilid delay is bigger than this on that, um, or, or some other compositional uh, elements, yeah, but we have been working with both Fourier and the Odyssey people to see if they can give us um, access to samples so that we can study the isoforms. So otherwise, we can do it with our cohort. Thank you. All right. So the um, the second point, I'm going to make it even more basic. What is you guys use um, um, biologicals, right? Not just you know, forget the PCSK9 inhibitor. Have you ever prescribed Humira? Prolia, e e e ever prescribed a monoclonal antibody? Uh, okay, so you're not the right audience for this. But, um, but so if you prescribe, let's say just 
you see Hugh Miller every night on TV, right? So you, even if you don't prescribe it, you are forced to say, what is this? And so if you, if you inject uh, an antibody against TNF-alpha, what happens? You block TNF-alpha. You block what? Do you block production? Do you block clearance? Do you block action? You're supposed to block action, right? So you block the action of a protein that has some function. When we inject a PCSK9 inhibitor, what do we do? We, w we don't want for PCSK9 to see the LDL receptor, right? So the antibody goes into the bloodstream, finds the target, and the objective is not, do not allow the target to do its job of finding and, and destroying the LDL receptor. When you inject under your skin um, a single injection of a PCSK9 inhibitor, you put it under the skin, it goes through lymphatics, through your lymph nodes, and eventually into the circulation. It's not a capillary uptake, but just a few hours later, you have plenty of the antibody in the blood. You inject, as you know, 75 to 140, 150. I think there is a, a maximum limit uh, in, uh, in biologics uh, that you can only cram 150 milligrams of IgG in one ml of volume. And that's why you know, they all try to stick with the one ml because it doesn't make a bump on, under your skin. And that's, a, that's an easy injection. Um, the antibody that you inject with 140 milligrams, in case you are mathematically inclined, is about the amount of IgG that you already have in 20 to 25 ml for your blood. So nothing spectacular, spectacularly intrusive for your body. And those are fully human IgG, so you don't do anything weird with them, uh, like producing antibodies to the antibodies. As the antibody comes into the circulation, you have injected over a hundredfold excess versus, versus target. Are you with me? Okay, the target is a low abundance protein. PCSK9 is very low abundance. When you inject the antibody, a few hours later, you are officially PCSK9 deficient. Okay, so look at that yellow line and it goes down to zero. And of course, your LDL will go down with some delay. However, again, we have a registry and we don't know what to do with it and we just play around with samples and um, and we discovered some people would say the wheel okay but sometimes you discover the wheel and you figure out that other people were putting the wheel in the supplements of the of their papers only because there was there is a reason why the pharmaceutical industry doesn't want for us to know that when you use a monoclonal antibody to block a circulatory protein, that protein level goes up, up, up. So we published this in the Annals of Internal Medicine just by showing what actually was known before, but it had been buried in every single paper that studied it in the supplements, in the supplement part, because they don't want to confuse you. Like it's an inhibitor, so it's, the levels are not going to go up. But we are. When you inject the PCSK9 inhibitor, just like when you inject Humira with any monoclonal antibody with a circulatory, not a cell bound, a circulatory target, the target will go up because you are locking the target in the circulation with an immune complex that has very slow uh, clearance rate. Is that so? We we published this and. Um, and w but we didn't know what to do with it. Okay, that's clever. Um, PCSK9 levels go up tenfold, twentyfold. Okay, so if you if you want to say, is there any practicality to this? Well, just imagine you are being treated, and all of a sudden a fever, a drop in pH, or something induces an acute disassociation between PCSK9 and the monoclonal antibody. Well, that day your LDL will go to 1,000 plus because you become a, a homozygote LDL receptor negative person because you have so much PCSK9 that it will kill all, all your hepatic LDL receptors. It's a theoretical point, but it's definitely, we didn't want to scare anyone. We didn't put in the annals of internal medicine. We said it's actually a good strategy to see if somebody is injecting properly, is not lying, and the or there are no funny business in the ability of the antibodies to encounter the target. It, it has to go up. We um, continued and, um, and showed that it's, uh, it's an effect that's maintained. Look, look at the levels, okay? They, they go up 
enormously. So there are no human beings out there that have levels of PCS canine that high. This is, this is ten folds and folds higher than, um, than normal. So what is, but even with that, we didn't think we had done anything uh, clever because we just found this thing and this thing, isn't it obvious? And what we thought was, it is super ob obvious because, because when you inject the antibody, you are blocking PCSK9 from finding the receptor. PCSK9 uses the receptor as its own clearance modality. So when you block that clearance modality, you lock the target into the circulation. So we didn't think we had done anything special. Uh, we just uh, did what, um, what, what you expect to see when you disallow a protein from the circulation to exit through its natural route. So the best idea we could come up with, uh, we, and uh, uh, this I think was in the supplement of the Annals of Internal Medicine, um, it's an algorithm to work the PCSK9 inhibitor resistant patient, which is an elusive patient, is not very common, but now we have people that contact us from all over the world with, uh, with resistant cases and they send samples to us and we study them with the first step being the levels of PCSK9. So it's, it's a clever thing, but, and it's probably gonna give us uh, an insight into how a human being may not respond to PCSK9 inhibitor therapy. For those of you who understand metabolism, this is not like not responding to an ACE inhibitor or not responding to a statin. PCSK9 inhibitors are blocking the main regulator of cholesterol trafficking. If you block your PCSK9, your LDL must go down 50, 60%. If it doesn't, there is something very interesting going on that we haven't figured out. Just now, if you know, just the Fourier out, out of 27,000 plus people just published a paper showing 53 suspected cases of no response. But even there, if you look at the details, they say, of course, we need to trust that the patients were doing the injection. And um, so it just, we, you, we don't have a clear sense of whether the, the true PCSK9 inhibitor resistant patient doesn't it even exist. Okay. Um, I have a good news for you. Since I'm going too slow, the part that was going to kill you, I will have to really uh, glaze through and just give you a flavor, okay? But that was coming. This was, this was supposed to be candy. In case it was a bitter candy, you can just imagine the end of it, right? But what we decided to do was this. All right, so we're simply blocking the clearance. I, I, I need to know if, if I'm making sense up to this point. The PCSK9 inhibitor blocks the clearance of PCSK9. That produces an accumulation. We discovered the, the wheel, and uh, we are going to use it for a very pragmatic approach of uh, investigating a resistant case. Then I said, can we see it in the mouse? Okay. Can we inject the equivalent monoclonal antibody in the mouse? We, get, we got a murine-specific monoclonal antibody from Amgen to work with the mouse. and. Um, we reproduced the same effect, but we reproduced it um, too fast, too fast. Look, in two hours, we have an accumulation of over tenfold. This is weird, okay? because clearance of PCSK9, the turnover of PCSK9 is supposed to be a couple of pools a day. So just imagine this protein that normally leaves at a rate of two pools per day, you block that exit, you should double every 24 hours, right? And actually, in the mouse, you go tenfold in just a couple of hours. Either this is the fastest protein ever exiting the circulation in the history of uh, biology, or there is something else going on. And um, again, I'm not showing you anything. This is not a complete story, and that's why it's not even incomplete. It's the beginning of a story. Um, but it shows how you can start from observations in patients and take it to the bench and then actually come up with a, with a complete uh, program of, uh, of investigation. We don't find the same effect in animals that have no LDL receptor. So th that effect is due to, to the abolishment of, um, of the LDL receptor pathway in a normal mouse. Um, and, uh, 
And this is just a comparison. It, 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 in, I, the data is presented in terms of fold, but do you mind looking at baseline levels? So in animals that are born without LDL receptor already have tremendous accumulation of PCSK9 because, again, PCSK9 leaves through the LDL receptor. Okay? But when you then ha add the antibody, you don't do anything there, but uh, you do it in animals that have the LDL receptor. So what, what causes the increase in plasma PCSK9? It's either just the halted clearance, as we were expecting at the beginning, but isn't it possible that we have some effect on synthesis? If you think of it, I, I am, of course, a lipid nerd, and, and uh, when I went to the Gladstone, it was for different reasons. Uh, uh, then, then David, I actually joined in 1988 on the wake of um, Goldstein and Brown getting the Nobel Prize and Bob Melly not getting it. And uh, the difference between the two groups was that one was cellular biology and the other one was physiology. And um, now with the PCSK9, we have in a way the uh, revenge of physiology, a, a circulatory protein that dominates over cellular regulation mechanisms. But um, wouldn't it be great if um, actually there is sensing mechanisms for PCSK9 production so that when we use a monoclonal antibody to block the action of PCSK9, we also do one thing unexpected. We prohibit the reentry of PCSK9 in the liver. And if there was a sensing mechanism for reentry, maybe there are um, counter regulatory systems that allow for overproduction of. Um, of PCSK9 to contribute to this uh, unexpected accumulation. Um, so I just, for, I, I am not as uh, evil as I look. So for the sake of, uh, of your health, I will not give you any more details of this. These are some heavy duty experiments that we did, but they just, in general, our storyline now supports the notion that when you block PCSK9, the accumulation that you get in the blood is partly due to blocking clearance, but also partly to an unexpected upregulation of production, completely unexpected. So that in the blood, you have more PCSK9. In the cells, you have more PCSK9. Let me um, just um, try to go back to how much time do you have? Fif 10 minutes? 10 more minutes? How are you guys feeling? Feeling good? Excited. You're excited? <laughs> Very excited? Okay. Um, so I'll take it back to the plaque. And this is where it could get really painful, but I will try to just gesticulate it for you rather than uh, force you to look at slides. So remember the, um, the in enormous drop in LDL in Fourier and Odyssey producing a 15% risk reduction over two or three years in cardiovascular events? What about the anatomy? What about the plaque? So the, um, the GLAGO trial produced the same thing as the Fourier and Odyssey, a nice drop in LDL. And with that, with intravascular ultrasound, um, what they found was a shrinkage of a non-culprit plaque that was around 50% or less at the time of the first test of 1%. Now, Steve Nissen and Steve Nichols, they get excited about this. And I am happy because to me, every time I see regression, I know that one thing has happened, no progression. So the no progression is the best claim that you can work with as you face a tiny amount of regression. But Look at, um, at uh, for example, here. Do you, can you believe that one third of subjects whose LDL is down to 30 manages to grow a plaque over a period of a couple of years? So the plaque actually can not shrink and even continue to grow when you have almost eliminated cholesterol from the blood. What does that mean? And also composition-wise, they couldn't find any differences. They do virtual histology, and they couldn't come up with anything credible in terms of, uh, of significant changes. This is just an idea of how it works with all the available clinical studies. It's, um, uh, you, you can set, sense there a limit. So look at on-treatment LDLs in different trials. 
going all the way down to the Glagov with 37. Look at uh, the percentage ateroma volume shrinkage. Do you see a, con a constant there? It's 1%. That's what you shrink when you obsessively do one thing, eliminate the atherogenic offense. So we get it. I think we are at the point of getting it. If you eliminate atherogenic offenses, the plaque changes in the sense that it will not grow anymore. So this growing thing knows that you're doing something right, and it stops. It will not give away material just because it doesn't grow anymore. So regression, and that's what I like to convey to people that don't study this issue on a daily basis, regression does not happen because you block regression, progression. You block progression, that's good, of course, because if your intent is to regress, you cannot have progressive forces at play. But the absence of progression is not an inducer of regression. That is a sad reality. Our plaques don't change, neither in composition nor in size, when you, when you make everything perfect for our patients. Right? If I have your attention, that means that we have work to do to identify real triggers, real targets, to tell the plaque, OK, it's time to send material out. Start moving out. So wh whatever you do with your patients, your good work, if you think about it, when you are satisfied with a, with a beautiful regimen that you have selected for your most uh, high-risk patients, you haven't done anything that targets the plaque ever. Okay? You control diet, body weight, glucose, blood pressure. Everything is systemic with a prayer of a local action. And uh, the plaque is a local tissue. There are targets there. There are possible therapeutic targets. And there are cells that, if prompted the right way, might move. And um, five minutes, OK? But I need you to pay attention. Because it's a strange story, OK? It's a story that I started as, a, as someone interested in cholesterol, and then I followed it to something completely different. So let me start with, with, um, with one statement, that the LDL receptor is part of a large family. And the family includes uh, one member that is uh, kind of linked to lipid metabolism, kind of linked to a million other things. It's called LDL receptor-related protein, or LRP. And it used to be LRP, now it's LRP1 because there is a bunch of LRPs. But anyway, so LRP in the olden times was um, identified as the remnant receptor. You know, for those of you, uh, David remembers, but Joachim Hertz from uh, EMBL in Heidelberg um, discovered LRP1 and um, presented it as the remnant receptor and promptly was offered a job in Dallas with Golson and Brown, and he's still there. He's done a full career, and he has brought the LRP all the way to the blood-brain barrier and to neurobiology. But um, I was simply curious of one thing. Uh, I, at that time, as David says, we were working with bone marrow transplantation, modulating, uh, engineering marrow. And one idea was we were uh, uh, serially going with removal of of, of single proteins from macrophages to see the effect on atherosclerosis, right? So we removed the scavenger receptor, we removed EPOE, we removed the LDL receptor, and next was LRP. So just imagine this, this thing here, this receptor, common receptor, highly expressed by all cells, including macrophages. We removed it from the bone marrow. And, um, and what we found was that if you look at macrophages that do not have LRP, they do not pick up VLDL or VLDL remnants. So our expectation was if you work with uh, an in vivo system where you remove LRP from macrophages, you will see less atherosclerosis because there will be less internalization of VLDL. What we saw was the opposite more atherosclerosis, a lot more. We saw inflammatory uh, changes. We saw um, cell death. We saw inability to clean up cell cellular debris. And so it was a long story. Se several papers over the course of seven to 10 years where we um, mounted a, um, 
uh, uh, body of knowledge saying the linking LRP to inflammation, necrosis, and uh, elimination of cellular debris, which is a process we call atherocytosis. And, um, and this atherocytosis business is very important. Like, I if you don't, you don't need to know anything about this. Can you follow the colors? So these are two different types of mice, and they make bad atherosclerosis. So you're looking at a cross-section of the beginning of the aorta, and the green is a bunch of lipid-laden macrophages. So the, uh, the extent of green is the same in, in the two groups, right? Can you tell, more or less? Just forget the pink on the other side. Just make sure that if everything was green, it would be the same type of lesion. It's a big, fat lesion in the artery wall. Well, one has live macrophages, and the other one has a big core of dead macrophages. So if you were to induce regression, how can you ask the dead cells to move? That is a tough one, right? But the live cells can move. They are still alive, and they used to be mobile, and so they can be triggered into mobility again. So what we're saying is that with, with LRP, this in negative influence goes beyond inflammation into necrosis. Um, I actually don't know how to make this easier, but um, uh, we have a collaboration with um, Stanford, and some of you may have seen um, a paper uh, from Stanford showing that um, that CD47, which is um, a don't eat me signal, uh, is critical in atherosclerosis. If you block don't eat me, you get eat me, right? So if uh, if you by blocking don't eat me and you uh, trigger eat me responses, then uh, you will have uh, improvement in atherosclerosis. So we, we try to combine the two projects, and we have a, a, a good collaboration going on with Stanford showing that the CD47 pathway and, uh, relies on LRP1 through a TNF-alpha connection. So that's all I can tell you here up to this point. I want to just finish by saying that, um, that we applied our method to study regression. So now we have a pro-inflammatory single molecular change that induces inflammation, and it's bad for atherosclerosis when the plaque is growing. So we just wanted to see what that does when the plaque is shrinking. And in the mouse, you can do it beautifully because you don't have the smoking, the belly, the hypertension, and the many, many years. You have a manipulation. You first induce atherosclerosis by, by creating a horribly hypercholesterolemic environment. The atherosclerosis is, is not that complex. It's all macrophages coming in. There is no calcification, no necrosis, no microhemorrhages. Uh, and then you invert you create a beautifully perfect environment and see what the plaque does under those circumstances. We use the APOE model and the bone marrow transplantation to do that. And um, what we found, and we published it last summer in circulation, was um, that the uh, removal of LRP1, this nasty pro-inflammatory um, change that we had seen before under progressive conditions, again, surprises us by inducing more regression. Now, at one point, we need to abandon the keyword LRP because it's such a housekeeping protein. There is no possibility in the world to use it as a therapeutic target, but it must be an indicator of what may be happening in the plaque and whether or not. Now, if I had the courage, I may, find, I may master the courage before, it, um, before I'm done in a minute, um, but First, let, let me tell you that what happens in the plaque with this, with this uh, regressive environment where the macrophages are supposed to be still pro-inflammatory under a regressive environment, what we're seeing is that the uh, LRP uh, is actually uh, linked to fewer pro-inflammatory macrophages in the artery wall. However, we think it's not fewer macrophages because they have more anti-inflammatory but because probably they left, okay? And actually, we find them in the, um, in the um, 
you know, this, this is a slide that by itself will require 10 minutes, but it's uh, mediastinal, uh, mediastinal lymph nodes versus, uh, versus lymph nodes from, from a, a, a control area. And uh, you can see what happens with, uh, with pre-labeled macrophages that pass through the plaque. They actually move along and end up in the, in the mediastinal lymph nodes. So that we have this kind of idea now, and I will share it with you if you promise that I am still your visiting professor for the rest of the day, that um, perhaps we shouldn't be so, so negative for inflammation and all for all forms of inflammation because it's possible that a macrophage that keeps an inflammatory stance in a regressive environment is what you need in order for activate exit and mobility okay so just saying and then uh, and then i think eventually we may come up with uh, with good data for it and for now we started um, doing a, a, a an unbiased search and we have some some targets that come out of the um, comparison between LRP negative macrophages and controls under different conditions. And, um, and the, the ones that are highlighted that uh, are uh, linked in a, in a pathway that is credible and that we're investigating now. This is our, now our line of research. We, uh, we are committed to move beyond the uh, esoteric term of LRP that has no future to what kind of, of pathway it is uncovering and what kind of clues it is giving us. We think it is telling us that, that anti-inflammatory interventions, of course they are good in general, but th there may be a need for maintaining some degree of, of inflammation. And I, for, because I am um, kind, I will skip the uh, conclusions, in particular the conjectures. And there is a bunch of people that have uh, worked on this project. This is my research group with the floating head of Michael Shapiro, who couldn't make it that day. And this is the clinical group with the floating head of Bart Duell, who couldn't make it that day. And we are proud to be the only uh, medical center that uh, allows you to pretend you are in a ski resort as you go see patients. Thank you so much.